also to have every right that every citizen has, and that includes the right to vote. So I'm committed to having a vote as a DC resident. Obviously, I could move to Maryland or Virginia if the vote meant that much to me and I needed it immediately, but I want it here. And I think we have a right to have it here and I want to do what it takes to make it. Now, having said that, okay, number one. Number two, I've been a lobbyist and an advocate for civil rights for about uh, 30 years, actually. And I've uh, worked first for the ACLU for many years nationally. I worked for the NAACP and now I'm president of an organization called the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. It's a coalition of about 200 national organizations committed to building an America that's as good as its ideals. I work as a registered lobbyist for social justice issues on Capitol Hill. The two bills that I have been involved in recently that exemplify what I think it will take to get a change in the status of DC residents one was the Voting Rights Reauthorization of 2006. It came with the highest vote total of any bill worked on uh, in this area, in Congress, Keenan Keller and others were involved in it, but it passed both the House and Senate with overwhelming votes at a time when uh, partisanship had reared its ugly head and Democrats and Republicans were fighting on every issue. The second bill that I've worked on that I think exemplifies the need for coalition politics is a bill called the Fair Sentencing Act. It was just signed into law by President Obama in the summer of 2010. It reduces the racial disparity between crack and powder cocaine uh, sentencing. The drugs are pharmacologically the same. The 101 disparity between crack and powder cocaine meant that thousands of African Americans and Latinos are incarcerated for far longer periods of time than their white counterparts even though the drugs they use are essentially the same. We've changed the status of, of that federal statute, First Amendment to the Drug Abuse Act of 1985, and the first elimination of a mandatory minimum since 1970. And the change came about at a time when Congress was as divided as it's ever been. The leaders on the Senate side were Dick Durbin, not surprisingly, but Jeff Sessions, Senator from Alabama, and in the House, it was John Conyers and Nancy Pelosi and Steady Hoyer, but it was also the Speaker, John Boehner, and others who had to make it happen. So having made those changes, I know how to uh, Capitol Hill works, and I know how changes occur. Uh, let me give you a couple of quick observations. First, uh, you can only achieve success if you're working in coalition with others. If you're not pursuing coalition politics, you're not pursuing the politics to achieve a victory in the 21st century. Secondly, for anything affirmative that you want to do, as opposed to doing something negative, stopping a bill. If you want to move a bill affirmatively, you must have the votes of both Democrats and Republicans. I don't care who controls the House and Senate. It doesn't matter. There are insufficient Democratic votes to ultimately achieve the success you need. Now, people have a different view on that, perhaps, but I'm telling you what works, and that's based on 30 years of experience. Lastly, you're not going to have a movement for DC voting rights until there is a movement within the city for voting rights. This is an issue that lacks passion in the general population. You are passionate, you are committed to it, but this issue has been around a long time. I'm dedicating my remarks tonight to Julius Hobson, okay? That's a name that probably means very little to people who are <laughs> the younger uh, members of this audience. But Hobson was an activist. I went to high school with his son. He filed a suit in 1966 to challenge the tracking system in Washington education program. It was called Hobson versus Hanson. The opinion of Judge J. Skelly Wright is one of the brilliant analyses of how discrimination occurs in our education system. Hobson was an activist, but he was also sophisticated. So let me just say, action without strategy is chaos. Okay? Action without strategy is chaos. And simply introducing a bill doesn't mean that there is a commitment to moving legislation, John. I mean, I'm just, you know, I want to draw a distinction between introducing a bill and creating a movement. There is no movement currently for DC voting rights that moves beyond an elite small group of activists. If you want to make this movement gain footage, you got to work in Anacostia, you got to work in Northwest, you got to work in all elements of the city. And when we talk about what makes DC voting rights important, 
the average rank and file citizen of the city has to understand why it makes a difference to them. Right now, they don't. And so, you know, simply having people get arrested to highlight the symbolism of it, I think it's important. The hunger strike is very important, and I don't want to take anything away from that. But I think you need much more in the way of strategy, substance, and grassroots activism. We need to build a movement. I'll close with this. You know, the NAACP was founded in 1909. I'm wearing my NAACP cufflinks tonight, okay? Uh, NAACP, had there been no NAACP, there would have been no Martin Luther King standing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, August 28, 1963, okay, talking about his dream. And had there been no King giving that speech on that day, there would have been no Barack Obama accepting his Democratic Party's nomination 45 years to the day. That's what a movement can do. In the absence of a movement, we're engaging in feet debates. And let's move to the substance. Okay, thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, and, and we will come back to the issue of, of how to build that movement locally. Um, uh, but, but keeping with the, the, the layout of, of the program, if we could go with Keenan Kelly next. Well, it's good to join this distinguished panel. I've been privileged to work with everyone up here. And it's also great to look out into the audience and see so many friends. I've, I've worked with many of you. I'm my neighbor, Eleanor Hart, who's out here in the audience. And I think the way that I want to approach this is to really dive into the issue. Um, I have to say that at the outset, as the father of two native Washingtonians, and that's the way that I always frame this, the father of two native Washingtonians. Much of what I do here in the city is because of my children and focusing on the rights and the needs of all the children across Washington, D.C. This is a generational issue, and we need to make this investment in gaining the voting rights for our children for the future. If we look at it that way, I think it puts in a better context what it is we're about and the kind of commitment that we need to make. One of the things that um, I think everybody needs to understand is that when we talk about Congress generally, um, we need to be more specific than that. The House and the Senate are very, very different places with uh, very different kinds of operations uh, and very different kinds of political climates. Um, if you look at uh, the House, and we have um, Daryl Thompson here who can talk very specifically, I think, about the Senate. If you look at the House, it's not necessary in the House to convince everyone of your position. Okay? You don't need to actually move 400 plus people in the House. What you do, however, need to do is to move a group of very specific people. You need to move leadership. In both, in both the majority and the minority, and you need to move the committee chairs of jurisdiction. Okay? So when you start to pile up uh, co-sponsorship for bills, and I went back yesterday and I looked at the co-sponsorship levels for all the, the DC bills, we're hovering at around 14, 15, 16 for, for every bill, and it's really the usual suspects. So the fact that we actually have uh, that level of co-sponsorship means that we need to really hunker down and focus on the individuals who are going to be necessary to help us move this legislation. If you look back at, at the dynamic that we had uh, two Congresses ago around the legislation that would have given us a vote for the district in exchange um, for a vote for Utah, that's a classic case of how the House works. And around the, the D.C. House vote bills versus the D.C. state vote bills, you have a very different kind of dynamic. In the, in, in the Senate, when we were looking at, at that legislation, the Senate almost took an academic view of it. And Wade can talk about this because Wade was, was very much involved in it. But in the House, we had a much more down and dirty dialogue about this. This was about a pure exchange. Okay? Because at the political level that we're working at right now, it's a zero-sum game. If we add the District of Columbia, that's good for Democrats. And what's good for Democrats in terms of votes is bad for Republicans. So one of the things that we need to do is to <coughs> elevate the issue of district voting rights above that of mere everyday politics. Wade talked about framing this as a human rights issue. 
and it's very important. John talked about the fact that we give up billions of dollars every year in taxes. The flow of money out of the District of Columbia to states whose representatives have been hostile to our voting rights is compelling and shocking. Everybody needs to understand that. When you look at the fact that our citizens serve in our military and die for their country, yet do not have rights, is shocking and offensive. So everyone should get up in arms about that. But the issue is, to get back to what Wade was talking about, what kind of transformative movement or transformative moment do we need to galvanize this as an issue inside the District of Columbia so that when we go to the House, when we talk to members very specifically, targeted members, and say, this is an issue of basic human rights. It's an issue of basic fairness. And you need to understand where we are on this, and you need to elevate this issue beyond politics, that they feel this in their heart, and that we frame this in a way that allows us to reach into their districts, if necessary, to make them feel that. I salute the hunger strikers because that is an issue that is transformative. When we have uh, a person, a, a citizen of the district who dies in the military, 